mic is good awesome um so i'm not sure if uh if you're hearing the client there was some weird stuff was happening with even though my system was muted i was still hearing audio uh, but anyways so welcome everyone to our latest edition of a casual stroll through lord of the rings online my name is matt elliott otherwise known as scenario on the message boards i'm a senior world designer uh for lord of the rings online and have been doing this for a while now, probably close to 20 years. Um, not all on Lord of the Rings. Um, but we're in, having a special treat uh, for you this time because we're going through Arid Luin, which is actually one of the very first regions I ever worked on. And there's also a lot of my very, very old artwork uh, in on display in this region um, from when this project was middle online. So we're going to be able to dive right into that. Um, so today's also an exciting day. We've got the Brawler and the new legendary item system uh, out there in the world for everyone to play with. Um, as I've said before, this stream is intended to be purely focused on world design. So while I'm sure you are excited both about the Brawler and about the legendary item system and about a whole slew of other things, I'm only going to be talking about world design stuff today. Um, certainly happy to answer your questions uh, as they pertain to that. Um, so, uh, without further ado, um, I say, I would say let's, uh, let's get it going. Uh, one of the first questions is, uh, have I got my drink? Yes, I do. I've got a can of dry ginger ale and I've got some water here. So if it's been a while before you see me like pause and take a drink, um, please let me know and I will, um, I'll take a drink and let's, so... We are in a weird space right now because um, because of the way Arid Luin is in general, and most newbie areas are, um, my character is currently in a weird state. Um, but I'm going to get him out of this weird state and get us on our tour of Arid Luin. I figured it, did, it would be best for us to start you know, up here, up in the north in... Thorin's Hall, and then work our way down through the Vales of Thrain and through the other areas of the of the region, and then we'll check out some behind the scenes, um, you know, stuff that is probably never going to see the light of day. But it's sometimes fun to go back and take a look at those things. Um, so let me fix my location real quick. Do, do, do. Turn that off and get on my goat. Um, I was planning to uh, brawler it up a little bit, uh, but did not have the time to dress my, my character accordingly. Um, but here we are. It is It is kind of late at night, so how about we start our tour by going right into Thorin's Hall itself. Um, at the time of it, the launch of the game, this was probably our biggest and most, most ambitious uh, dungeon space that we'd ever created. Um, we were really using it to test the capabilities of what we call our, our M rooms, um, just these large dungeon interior spaces. Um, and it is interesting, like running around uh, in this space kind of space now compared to when we first built it, because when we first built it, you know, I think we had in our heads this idea that this was like a big, big chunky space that it could be a little performance heavy uh, for our taste. It was maybe a little bit too high detail for our taste. And then you compare it to the stuff that we have out there in the game now and the, the level of detail that we have in a space like this and in, in a lot of our older regions um, that haven't gotten significant overhauls um, it comes across as a little low detail. Um, there, there have been some times where I've even like thought about uh, if I could... And if I had the time for it, I would like sit down and copy Thorin's Hall out and turn it into like a landscape space, kind of like what we did with, um, you know, for Erebor, the city portions of Erebor, not the the hall itself um, for the Allegiance Hall, but the the cities, the city space, and try to like do something similar, or like what we had done in Moria, and kind of try to give Thorin's Hall a bit more of a, a majestic Moria feel. Um, Again, if we if only we had the time, uh, but I remember 
spending a lot of time building this space in particular and thinking about how we want to do town services, how we want to have the different wings set up, um, you know, the, the different effects that we can apply here. We had an artist that did this awesome, you know, heat shimmer effect for when you get close to the, when you get close to these forges, um, and as well as a little bit of a, uh, a fire effect on top of that. I think I, I remember early on in beta players accidentally dying on that, um, or sorry, being, becoming defeated, uh, on the forges because they just they got a little bit too close or you know they just weren't paying too much attention to to what was happening um, so i do love the music in this space it's just kind of this i don't know it's a little sad it's a little happy um the horns are great um one change that we did make recently to this space and and this is by and large, just driven by um, kind of my own frustrations in here is you'll note that I am not getting dismounted at the moment. Um, one of the portions of the dungeon, since it was considered kind of a social space, we disabled the ability for, um, for mounts to be ridden around and down into the uh, tavern. And that was largely because we wanted it to we wanted to maintain the the feel of it being a social space but especially during festivals and just doing content in here it was actually kind of frustrating to get like dismounted basically as soon as you get down to the bottom of the stairs um one of the other fun bits of trivia about this space too is it's one of the first spaces where we started experimenting with the um, connected dungeon map system so if you look up at our at the little radar disc, you'll see I go from one Thorin's Hall map into another Thorin's Hall map. Um, and this is really kind of the proof of concept for that piece of technology way, way back when, too. Um, certainly has gotten a little bit darker uh, in here since the, uh, the new attenuated lighting system went into place because a lot of these light sources... Um, feathered a bit more um, than they do now because the lighting um, affects by pixel as opposed to vertices. Um, I don't think I'll be able to get into this quite yet. Um, but eventually. Uh, I'll teleport us in there so we can take a look at it. Um, so I will make my way back out of, well, make our make my way down to Thorn's throne, um, and then take a quick pause to look at some questions, um, so that we can see what people are asking. Um, and I'm going to take a drink. I love the mirror effect too. This is a lot of fun when we get to use it. It's a little tricky to place sometimes because it's hard to actually see in our tools, um, but when it's placed right, it looks great. There we go, here's Dwellin. Alright, do a quick look at some questions. Uh, So, uh, Shoreless Skies asks, is there a way for us to measure the scale to keep things consistent? I'm thinking about the underground space versus uh, Moria versus Gundabad. Um, so, I, whenever we build a space, at least for my own building purposes, we have um, scale reference models. Um, they're like super simplified versions of an average avatar's height. Um, and sometimes we'll also bring in, you know, av you know avatar artwork or NPC artwork. Um, so one of the things that I was building very recently, which I can't talk about yet, um, while I was building it, I had uh, like 30 or 40 different scale reference models placed all around in different spots just so that I could make sure that, you know, a walkway didn't seem like it was too big or too small. Um, but sometimes we want to have, oh, I can't use that yet. Uh, sometimes we want to have that kind of like big open space that seems like a little bit off scale. Um, all right, and then we'll start. Maybe two, there we go. 
give us a little bit of sunlight while we walk around. Um, so Imanar says, uh, these are very elaborate halls for a wandering exile. Uh, you have to wonder why Thorin needed to retake Erebor so badly. Couldn't he just expand his existing holds in Ered Luin? But I guess that's a story question. Um, so I think some of that is, you know, wanting to make sure from a game perspective that we deliver on um, certain experiences when you come into the space. You know, not really, like knowing that we eventually wanted to get to Moria, but not really knowing if we would be able to get to Moria um, at the time that we were building all of this. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could, we could have a space that kind of felt like a grand dwarf hall. Um, that may be a bend a little bit in the lore, um, but, you know, ultimately we want to make sure, we wanted to make sure that we were kind of hitting the notes. Um, we also, like, I think as far as the character of our dwarves anyways, um, and how we represent them in Lotro, they tend to, like, go a bit big. Like, they, they tend to go, you know, go big or go home kind of uh, when it comes to their architecture. I mean, you look at you know, right up here with the, you know, statue of him, you know, the statue of Thorn himself, you know, up in the mountains. Like, I think that's a pretty good example of kind of their, you know, their motives when it comes to, you know, leaving their impression on the world. And I'll have to get to a different vantage point in order to really see the, uh, the statue. Um... So, how many dwarf holdings have indoor rivers? Uh, it seems very risky, a very risky thing to have. Rivers can experience floods, um, and that can be really bad indoors. Um, yeah, there are um, there are examples of uh, rivers running through cave systems, running through mountains and whatnot out there in the world. So it's not you know out of the question that something like that could exist. Um, you know, I think in that in that instance, I think we are trying to sell a little bit the story of the the waterway that flows, you know, out of the mountain here and further into the south uh, into inaccessible areas. Um, and we can see the statue of Thorin up there. Certainly not as impressive as what is out in the Ironfold, but you know, it's his own little piece of uh, own little piece of land. Uh, how do you begin the process of designing an interior space? Do you start with a floor plan? Um, so I think it varies a little bit from person to person. Uh, for me, I like to uh, sketch it out, whether that is actually like busting out my, my tablet monitor here to the side and actually like physically drawing a map um, or being in our world builder tools and um, doing some very rough, like, block outs of a space. You know, just kind of using our dungeon shells or our landscape to roughly sculpt out how we want the space to be. Um, you know, different, different designers work in different ways. Um, often for instances, uh, we usually ask our content designers um, and encounter designers to give us a floor plan for what they want out of the space. You know, the kinds of hallways and rooms and whatnot that they want um, for their encounters. And then we kind of work with that blueprint um, to fo more fully realize the space. And there may be opportunities for us as we're building to be like, oh, well, this would really be really cool if there was a, you know, you know uh, another hallway here, another cave here. <clears throat> I think one of the things uh, with the mission system that has been really kind of a lot of fun is a lot of those spaces are not spaces that are particularly, um, a lot of those spaces are not spaces that have a lot of like direction associated with them. You know, we, we have a general theme for what a given set of missions is going to be about. Um, and then we can kind of just go, you know, and, and kind of let our imagination go. So for the stuff in Elder Slade, it was really the designers being like, we want, you know, 15 dungeon spaces for the mission system. And I, you know, I was able to just kind of take that and just be like, do you, you know, ask them if there were any high level, like, 
needs that they needed to have they wanted to have met with with that and then if there weren't then I could just kind of let my imagination run wild um, to come up with those spaces and we've done something similar with the Gundabad missions um, as well um, with like some high level just like ideas and then we just run with it um, Druid's Fire says ooh stuff you can't talk about yet um, Yeah, so the the we are, you know, forging ahead on our um, on our efforts beyond Gundabad now. Um, the world team in particular, we're all like, we're all diving into stuff that is post update thirty one, um, which is which is nice uh, to be able to kind of start the next thing, and it's nice to get out ahead um, of our content team as well. You know, I think that's one of the things where the way world design operates best is if we're able to have a conversation with our content designers um, pretty early on and then from there just start kind of building carte blanche and and work towards what their ultimate high level ideas are and it allows us a little bit of an opportunity to kind of put our mark on the spaces that are being built as well And show this guy says a wild turbine logo appears. I missed that. Um, not sure where it was, but hey, uh, maybe we can hunt, maybe we can track that down. <laughs> um, what modern technology would you love to have in Lotro? I would love, like, I think the, you know, the the. Per pixel lighting attenuation system, I think, is easily one of the best additions um, to Lord of the Rings Online. But I would really love a like full modern HDR lighting system that isn't as uh, restrictive as our current lighting system is. Um, it it's just there. There are a lot of things that you could do with better and more accurate lighting than you know we currently have available to us and it would be uh it would be really great to be able to uh to be able to do that uh ah, okay the the logo appeared in our in our debug windows all right well i will make sure to uh to talk with some folks to see what uh what changes if any need to be made there thank you um so this area back up here, originally when we were building this, we were thinking about building north. Um, but as we kind of honed in more and more on the direction that we wanted the story of the game to go, um, the less and less it made sense for us to travel north. Um, and the funny thing is, with, with regards to um, the game when it was Middle Earth Online, like, let's back up, back up. Like, a lot of the landscape all around Arid Lewin had little towns and villages dotted um, all over the place. Some of which we'll see in a little bit. <clears throat> I remember receiving these assets when we were working on this space and just like how great they felt and how different they were from just working with the elf with the dwarf stuff which was very you know square and rectangular and we have this elf stuff which is you know it still has flat sides but it's got a bit more of a rounded appearance to it which was just like a, a very different way to work um because you have to you have to think differently in terms of how you use the assets, how you place the assets. Um, it is weird, just kind of like walking around here, with there being nothing in here, Am I in, even in the right spot. Yes. Okay. Making sure I'm not in a weird state for you all. Um, so we need more Blue Mountains in Lotro. Um, I think 
I think that's something that, you know, given time, we would love to do that too. You know, there's certainly, I think, a we have a greater um, agency to kind of go in and fill in the world now than than we did previously because we, you know, I think we were we were kind of beholden to see the you know the end of this the end of the ring you know and once we got to mordor that kind of like opened up the doors for us to start looking at and exploring you know other areas of the world and even looking back and um even looking back and you know tinkering in spaces that we'd been before you know it does make it a little weird because sometimes those areas may not be able to fit into the um story quite as neatly just because a lot of our areas are uh, region locked or, or not region locked time locked um so like wildwood the story in there was a little tricky to like tie into happenings around the world because the um because the story was set in a certain way and there's certain expectations of player level when you go in there and where are the players in the world in the epic story when they might come back here to do this sort of thing. So we have to dance around that a little bit. Um, so let's see. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Going down through some more questions. Uh, yep, yeah, my, my sky is a little bugged at the moment, but that's okay. It'll look pretty while we're running around here. Um, are there any other paths to the Grey Havens besides the barricaded roads at the south end of Rath Tereg? I mean, there are. Are they ones that are accessible? Are they ones that are built yet? TBD. Um, you know, we have, you know, I, I think for me, my, my greatest um, regret with Lord of the Rings was we launched it with... Um, we launched it without connecting the Shire to Arid Luin. And, you know, one of these days, hopefully, we'll be able to, we'll be able to resolve that. Um, and that'll put us, like, if not in contact with things like the Grey Havens, but in viewing distance of those. Um, you know, it's, when, when that, uh, when that day comes, I will be a very happy person and will happily jump on building that connection. Um. So one of the things too that I wanted to, to talk about a little bit was as far as like landscape features that seemed like a something that was like really interesting and exciting is you see how this snow line here is, you know, running along the, the cliff edge. Um, this was a kind of a new feature that was introduced for our terrain textures as part of building all of this. And what it really is, is, you know, most whenever we paint uh, terrain textures, the brushes that we use are usually like a little bit soft. They're fuzzy around the edges so that we can blend well. Um, these terrain textures here are set up so that it's that blending, that smoothing doesn't really exist and we can adjust that on the scale. Um, so the designer that set these up is this is actually two terrain textures. Um, there's the normal snow and then there's a darker snow underneath it and they both overlap and try to create the illusion of like a soft edge with shadow underneath it. Um, so uh, Druid's Fire says, I'm hearing a lot of praise for the hook consolidation among our housing community. I'm happy that it's, uh, it's live. I think it's live. Uh, it, it's either live now or will be going live soon, but, uh, but based off of that, it sounds like it is, uh, it is live now. Um, that was a like project that I've wanted to do since the beginning of the year um, and had the work all done um, and ready to go for update 29. But unfortunately, just the timing of it, we didn't have enough time to properly QA it. Um, so I didn't want to just put it out there um, without having it being tested to make sure that, you know, people don't lose their items. You know, the drawback to the consolidation was small hooks which could previously tilt um no longer do that uh they now rotate so if you had stuff on small wall hooks 
they might uh, they might need some adjustment. Um, but otherwise, this system should give you a lot more um, flexibility as far as um, how they how you use your housing items. Um, and I believe I've I added um, a little bit of an increased range uh, for movement on those hooks as well. So. Um, um, so Iwanar says, any lesser known Easter eggs like the snowman on top of the hill, uh, but not entered into the wiki? Well, speaking of the snowman on top of the hill, uh, he is right here. Um, I have talked about in the past how uh, one of our designers did uh, etch his and uh, his uh, partner's name or initials into uh, one of the trees in the southern portions of Ered Lewin. Um, I do not know exactly where that tree is anymore. Um, but I believe that tree still exists with the little heart and initials on it. Um, and when I discovered some of the stuff that he had done in, uh, Ered Lewin, like sneakily, or not Ered Lewin, even dim, sneakily signing his name, uh, on the landscape with, uh, terrain, type, terrain types, um, he said that there were other things out there like that in the world. Um, so... I'm sure there are things written in invisible ink, you know, names and birth dates and whatnot list, written on the world in invisible ink that I am unaware of. <laughs> uh, Druid's Fire says, can we get a hint or tease for the next major housing update? Um, you said on the forums, kin houses were going to return in it. Um, it is being worked on, but we have nothing to talk about in regards to it quite yet. Uh, we want to get past Gundabad, um, you know, get Gundabad out the door uh, before focusing too heavily on um, the next things that uh, you'll all be experiencing. Um, Gundabad's big, it's a lot of work, and, uh, and we're all excited about it, and we're looking forward to, you know, letting you all play uh, through it. Hey, and I can move again. Um, maybe. Uh, but we're not stopping, you know, we're continuing on, we're getting stuff going. Um, and pardon me, my server is a little upset with me right now. Uh, da, 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 da. Up in Hunter's Notch. Um, one of the things when we were building... Uh, out Arid Lewin was trying to figure out how we do uh, enemy camps for natural threats. Things like bears, lynx, birds. <clears throat> because this was really a lot of Lotro, a lot of what we propagated out through the rest of the game started here. Um, this was kind of our first region. Um, you know, the Shire, while the Shire and Breland were being built, um, this was already pretty well built from its times in uh, Middle Earth Online. And what it came down for us was figuring out what the content was in this space. You know, polishing how the landscape and the textures were used and building the monster camps. Um, and I think we probably had, or at least originally, some monster camps that in the early game that were more complex um, than they really should have been for such a early game experience. Um, the Shire in particular had some goblin camps that, even though they weren't group statted, were pretty rough uh, if you weren't... Um, if you weren't of a particular level. So the road past Sarner, that gate is still closed. Um, and it's actually... So Sarner is... There's a bit of trivia here because, you know, we were... In the update that we were going to introduce uh, both this dungeon up here and uh, the, the Barrow Dungeons, um, 
we were trying to figure out what to call this space and what stuck in my head was there were and and we'll go look at what the original Mio Sarnar looked like towards the end um, towards the end of the stream um, speed up my run um, so we were trying to figure out a name and I had in my head like seen the telepad information for you know a place called Sarnar and you know in its original locations it felt like kind of similar so we were like, oh, well, let's, let's call it Sarnar and let's make this our, our Lotro version of Sarnar since we're not going to be using the Mio version of Sarnar. Um, so this originally was one big, 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 big dungeon space um, and has, like the, the Barrow Dungeon in Breland, has since gotten um, broken up into other smaller spaces. But this was originally connected. Um, And this was kind of a test to see how big we could make a dungeon. Um, yeah, I think the Barrow Dungeon was kind of a test to see how like complex we could make a dungeon, and this one is very much a test to see how how expansive we could make one. Um, you know, I think the original one, which was all connected and everything, probably a bit too uh, bit too massive. Thus, you know needing to be broken down in the way it was, but, uh, you know, it, I don't think that stopped us, uh, from making larger dungeons, uh, going forward. Um, you know, I think we have some pretty impressively, significantly large dungeon spaces. Um, and these kinds of spaces like this help provide us the learning to, you know, to make them. Now watch as I get lost in my own dungeon. It's interesting the like, you know, like I was saying before too, just like the difference in level of detail compared to what we strive for now. You know what was, what we considered acceptable at one point, and what we strive for now are just like two. Two very different things. Um, so was so was Sarner in the original recent game? It was not. Um, I forget which update uh, post-launch. I think it was... So we we had a uh, cadence for... Um, we had a cadence for our updates that was kind of like on and off where we'd do a region and then we would do a, you know, smaller, you know, epic story update patch after that. Um... And I believe this and the Barrow Dungeon came out after Evendim, I think. I think we did, like, we launched the game, then we had Evendim, then we had uh, these come out, I think. But it's been, it has been a, uh, a long time. Um, so another question from Soft Snake is why don't we see the old Dwarvish building style in newer areas? Um, I think part of it is the set that we use heavily now is a very comprehensive and very flexible set for us. Um, and it makes it more appealing and easier to use um, when it comes to building out spaces. Um, you know, the the set that we just ran through and these pieces, like they are, they are less as comprehensive of a set, which means that often we would end up needing to supplement some of the Moria style stuff in it, in there anyways. Um, so it just, and because they're stylistically very different, it just 
has made it easier for us to use the newer set uh, going forward. Um, so Mirialis says, kind of a shame that these spaces aren't really challenging anymore for on-level players. Back in the day, you'd have to have a group to uh, group up for Sarner. Uh, so many great memories. Um, and I think so. I think the challenge system that are on the two legendary servers um, can kind of help you get some of that back. Um, you know, I think that's part of part of why those were introduced was as a way for players to, you know, kind of relive, I don't want to say relive the glory days, but like to, to relive a version of the world that was a little bit more challenging and harsher for them. Um, oh, I'm being told to drink. I remember, <laughs> uh, I remember playing through an alpha and beta in uh, in the North Downs and going through the Orc Valley there and and how how much fun it could be, but also how um, challenging it could be to get through all of that if you'd like. Okay, you got like a quarter of the way through, and then someone needed to log out, so the whole team would log out and say like, "Okay, we'll come back tomorrow to." Uh, to, to keep pushing forward and then there's the whole like okay now that we're here how do we get out and you know unfortunately a lot of the times with those challenging spaces the easiest solution for getting out of them was to just let yourself be defeated um Uh, a road that may or may not ever be opened. <laughs> Open that door. I think one of these days there will certainly be, you know, ev everyone has their own little like spots in the world that they want to see built. And I think like if we get to a point where, you know, we have the like free time to do it, you know, much, much like I did with Wildwood where someone is just like, I want to build out this area and they can start like just tinkering in that space on their own. And eventually you know, it can become, you know, an, an open space, you know, um, I think Wildwood, you know, took a bit of, uh, took some, uh, pitching around the, the pit to, you know, get people on board. Um, there were a couple of people that were just like, yes, this is a good idea. We're doing it. And then it just took that, uh, took that little extra oomph for us to turn it into an actual update. Um, so Edith Eldora says, according to the map, that gate leads to Sarner. Um, and yeah, I think the, the original thought and intent was that um, Sarner isn't just a cave system, um, that it is its own city. You know, that was kind of what we were thinking in our minds um, as far as, you know, what, what it is. Um, and that road, like if we were to ever open that door, could potentially lead to, you know, the the mountain city of Sarner. Um, so you know, talking about the like these assets and whatnot, one of the things that is um, challenging about working with a set like this too is because it is not incredibly comprehensive. It's very hard to. Uh, it's very hard to build something that doesn't look like it's just a stack of Lego bricks. Um, we do our best to mitigate that as much as we can. Huh. I didn't realize that was a thing. You learn something new every day. Um, so it can be hard to, you know, kind of not 
feel like you're minecrafting it up. Not that there's anything wrong with Minecraft, but it, it can feel hard to, you know, build a space that feels like it's it's a natural or or intentional thing versus a you know bunch of bricks slapped together. Well, we're almost to the elf lands. We'll get there. You know, the, I'm still figuring out the pacing on all of this. Um, this is in response to um, uh, Tim Bolton saying, like, can we even get through Eridlu in one goal, one go? You know, I think we get pretty close to uh, doing everything in one shot. Um, but I will try to streamline a little bit more for us. Um, so. We were talking a little bit about uh, complexity of monster camps uh, and whatnot, and I think the Wrath Tereg is an area that is complex for complexity's sake. Um, you know, we were we kind of had our goals for what we want monster camps to be in terms of interactivity, but I think we kind of built them too much like they were single-player game concert camps. Um, so, here, we'll do this. Since my goat runs slow, I run faster. Um, so these original camps here were very complex spaces with lots of uh, interactions going on with them. Tripwires and triggers and, you know, not scripted events, but like simple behavioral events to kind of make the space feel a little bit more exciting and dynamic. Um, you know, things like when we you get up to the spider camp, you know, it is it is a very, you know, can be a very intense space depending on um, where you go um, or how you approach it or how many other people are there. Yeah, where, I, where I'm going, I don't need any goats, and this will hopefully help streamline things a little bit more, uh, speed us along a little bit more. So like this camp here has a bunch of tripwires that like summon in spiders and then set them on patrols and make them like run around. And, you know, I think that's been toned down a bit uh, because that kind of experience was really rough for players unfamiliar with the game trying to just like get through the content. Um, you know, and especially since the game ultimately, you know, has become one that's a little bit more friendly um, in terms of casual play, um, particularly at lower levels. Um, so one of our designers did come through and gave you know, the landscape of, uh, particularly Phallic Lauren, a little bit of a touch-up. You know, he decided, you know, at one point, you know, we were looking at it, and it's just like the, the hills here were just so, so very steep. Um, and that often led to a problem where, like, players weren't really seeing much of anything when they were running around doing content. They didn't get to see, you know, couldn't easily see where they were going or where were they coming from. So one of the things that he did was he kind of, he, he mellowed out the grade, you know, the slope a little bit so that camera plays a little bit better um, for lower level characters. Um, uh, so uh, Soft Snake asks why elves and dwarves have to share the same region and not create two huge regions like Bree and the Shire. Uh, scheduling and timing. That was was purely it. You know, we wanted to... When, when Lord of the Rings Online pivoted to becoming, to being Lord of the Rings Online, we wanted to make sure that we had the ability to hit a certain date to launch the game. And... You know, that meant that we had to kind of think a little bit about how um, how much intense work we were going to be doing in order to make that happen. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, things like, you know, where 
you know, where do the dwarf and elf starter zones kind of exist in all of that? That was one of those things where it's like, well, we can kind of tie them together and make them work together. You know, I think, you know, not having a quintessential Shire was kind of a non-starter. And our goal for the epic story was always to kind of funnel everyone um, into Breland eventually. You know, all roads lead to Breetown, um, whether or not you're on a goat. Um, so that's kind of the, the backstory for it. It's not an exciting or interesting backstory, but that's, you know, that's where we are. Um, so I do have some, you know, unfinished spaces, you know, inaccessible spaces that, you know, I think you guys would enjoy seeing. We're at about the 10 minute mark right now uh, before we need to wrap up. So um, assuming the room is amenable to it, um, I can start kind of moving ahead onto those things if you would like. One vote for drink, one vote for yes, please. All right, so let's go to my big list of things. Um, so there, like I mentioned, there are a lot of places that um, exist in this area that are no longer accessible. Um, they were not particularly cleaned up like how we had in other in other areas. So, you know, for example, here is Sarner. Um, you know, it got far enough along in development that there's even, you know, horses to take you back and forth to certain areas. Um, so Sarner exists. It's on the landscape. But it's not in great shape. Maybe one day, like, the concepts behind it, you know, if we were ever to come to a space like this and, you know, kind of redevelop it for, you know, for an update, a Wildwood-style update, like, some of the ideas here can be repurposed. But, you know, this is, this is what exists of Sarner now. Um, we've got... The summit of split finger, um, which I'm not sure, quite sure how to. So as you can see here, remnants of you know terrain having cha been changed. Um, this looks like it was at one point a series of switchbacks um, based off of the fencing, but is no longer. Um, but can certainly give an impressive view uh, if we were to ever let players up here and I were to not have a uh, stickied day file. Um, and let's see, where else could we go? So we have another village here. Uh, I think this was called Grothmore at one point. But even then, this still does have like remnants of, you know, it was a functional town at one point because we have, you know, horses to things like Gondamon, Thornton's Hall, uh, and whatever Brandarth is. Let's see what, where this takes me. Oh, teleportation failed. So it's not taking me anywhere, that stubborn, stubborn horse. Um, but yeah, so these, these things all exist up in the mountains of Ered Lewin. <clears throat> They're just not accessible anymore. Uh, and... And I believe this is 
northwest of Thorin's Hall. I think this is Thorin's Hall up over here. Um, you can see, you know, the end of the world over there. I think these are the mountains of Evendim um, off in the distance. Let's check this out. No, they weren't. None of those were anything um, across the river from Keladul. Um, You'd think I'd learned my lesson. I was scouting in this area and did the same thing last night. Fell right off the edge. So this is a very, very old and unused dungeon space. Um, complete with a very, very old set of dungeon cell meshes. Um, This shows off these dungeon spaces a little bit better. It's interesting running around in here and um, how our philosophy in the heights of ceilings in dungeon interiors has changed. Because um, these are like the camera is like really close to the to the ceiling, you know, in here. And there was a certain point where we made the decision to make sure all of our interiors were a little bit taller in the ceiling, even even um, Hobbit interiors, so that the camera didn't feel like it was pushed in too much uh, on the player. So like coming back into a space like this where the, the ceiling is so, so low um, is just like, it, it's like interesting. To me like it's just like oh i'm not like i wasn't used to the ceiling being that low before um, you know for good or ill i think like i think having a camera like that can provide a certain kind of experience to the player while they're in there it can evoke a certain sort of like claustrophobia um but i don't think that it's something that we really want to uh, have be present all the time. Like we want to, we want to be aware of that kind of experience fatigue. Um, all right. Um, us out of these dungeon spaces and since there seems to have been a uh, lot of requests for the castles across the river see if we can't get ourselves up there before we close out the stream with the, the rework that was done on this space to just kind of give it a little bit more oomph. So, <clears throat> you know, one, one of the things I think I want to do uh, for a future one, and we haven't really gone into any of the housing neighborhoods uh, as part of these, um, I think I'd like to do a housing neighborhood dedicated um, casual stroll. So at some point we'll do one where we can, oh, and I go. Um, at some point we'll do one where we can um, 
where we can go through and do that. Because one of the things I did, I really was like happy with, with the Falathorn homesteads was bringing them down so close to the water um, and, and allowing players to kind of look out and see, you know, the rest of the game world um, outside of, you know, outside of the housing neighborhood. You know, I think Breland and the Shire and, and, you know, by its nature, the Thorns Hall homestead were all very like contained and Falathlorn, you know, we tried to open it up a little bit. All right, come on. Apologies, I know someone said that Vertigo was hitting. Um, so we are now entering unexplored territories. And I am at a loss for where the castle was. The fog doesn't help. Yeah, now I'm a bit lost. Further north. Further north it is, and away we go. Um, one of the tricky things, too, with building a region that has a river as a boundary is um, making that boundary feel plausible. Um, you know, so for example, here, like, we're using the reeds as our impassable, and we've used them as impassables before, so it's not too far-fetched that that would be a thing. Um, but we'll trek our way over here, and as you can see, just how, like, you know, unpolished and unfinished the space is. There we go. There it is. This may have, at one point, been a, um, a part of Mio, uh, Middle Earth Online design. Um, I certainly don't remember any stories about how it was being built, why it was being built, what it, its intents or goals were, um, and I don't think there are any, like, teleport location information indicators um, regarding it. Yeah, so the other tricky thing with building river impassables is like, how do we, when you get to a northern or southern boundary, how do we make the impassable implausible? Um, and I think the rocks in the river work well enough, um, but it is hard to, it's hard to sell that kind of, uh, that kind of thing in a river. Alright everyone, well it is a little bit after three so it is time for me to uh, wrap things up. Um, do a quick check to see if there are any other questions that anyone has um, before I call it a night. Um, so do want to give you a heads up that you know the next casual stroll is going to be happening a little bit sooner uh, than we usually do. We've been doing these about once a month um, but uh, with the release of Gun to Bad we wanted to do another one coming soon. Um, so it will be happening much sooner rather than later. So uh, keep your eyes out for that. You know, we've already we've already got it scheduled in our own internal calendars, and there should be announcements for it coming soon. Um, so yeah, last chance for any other questions. Uh, I'll give you guys a minute or so for that. Otherwise, you know, I thank everyone for for attending, and I know there were bigger and more important things happening in the world of Lotro today. Uh, what with legendary items and brawler being out there. Um, so I appreciate you stopping in, checking out Aaron Lewin with me, asking questions, coping with the day file that is stuck on me right now. Um, but this did give me an idea about where I could go to potentially fix that. 
Um, so yeah, uh, so when <laughs> Sauce Snake says, when will you fix the buggies, guys? Uh, well, if, if I knew exactly how to fix it, I would fix it. But I do have an idea um, because it was raining when we were in Thorin's Hall. So I'm wondering if it has something to do with uh, going in there uh, with a certain day file type not being supported, maybe. So that's something to look at. Um, uh, so we'll go with Ionar for the last question. Uh, I've heard there is a layer of water under the entire map. Is that true? It is not true. Um, the way water works is um, we can turn it on and off by segment of landscape by our land blocks, um, and then we can set the height of it. Um, so in places where we don't have a need for water, we don't have the water turned on. Uh, the water is always off uh, in those places. Um, it helps in terms of performance because that's one less thing that the game needs to worry about uh, because there is a decent amount of calculation that goes into like you know knowing whether or not a player is going to splash or swim you know through that space so not having it there just helps things a little bit um so yeah when when people do have reports of the the swimming flight stuff it should not be related to uh a specific water layer underneath everything um anyways so thank you everyone for uh for your time. Thank you for being here. Um, and I will see you guys, see you all next time. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the brawler. Have fun with the legendary item system. And, uh, and we will see you later.